introduction. Uh, meanwhile, I introduce myself. Maybe Karina, you can give me the presenter modus, then I can start sharing my slides. Um, so yeah, my name is Gabriel Rojas. I'm, I've been uh, at the DISC now for a little bit over a year when I joined the University of Innsbruck again. So I work at the DISC and at the Unit for Energy Efficient Buildings. And um, before that, I was um, at the um, University for Applied Science in Salzburg as a senior lecturer and researcher. And before that, I actually was uh, working for several years at the Unit for Energy Efficient Buildings. So I'm 50% uh, homecoming. Uh, um, my research focus uh, was and is uh, energy efficient uh, efficiency of buildings. Um, and in particular, um, as used to said, um, indoor environmental quality, um, indoor air quality, thermal comfort, uh, and how to combine uh, those two aspects, energy efficiency and indoor air quality. Um, yeah, my methods have been, um, or this, there was always a strong focus on numerical methods. Um, and uh, so building simulation and um, Today, I want to talk about um, fault detection um, in buildings using data-driven models. So I want to share, I'll share my screen. Right one. Can you see it? Yes. Excellent. <clears throat> so um, recently, or in the last years, I've been uh, moving more to um, uh, using um, data-driven models, uh, basically to um, try to use, make use of the readily available or more and more available uh, data that's out there um, to evaluate buildings or to use it for certain applications like default detection. Um, default detection itself, I'm this talk I won't be able to, or I won't present you uh, results of a finished project. This is work in progress um, and um, I'm Giving, I'll give you some sort of a basic and overview how this fault detection works, what are the methods and uh, what we're working on right now. And uh, hopefully in, uh, in some months, a year or two ahead, I can give you um, results uh, where we tested those methods uh, in actual buildings. So as a motivation, as you know, I work at the Unit for Energy Efficient Buildings, um, I want to shortly given motivation why I think this is important. Um, what you see here is basically the energy consumptions in buildings. And if you look um, at the um, U U European Union, I'll turn on my laser pointer um, right here, that's the, the number we often hear, 40% of the final energy use is consumed in buildings. So buildings do have a big share on the energy consumptions and uh, therefore also for the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so um, there is a big potential there for um, reducing energy uh, use. Um, that's also now with the recent developments in the Ukraine, I think a very important topic um, to get off of fossil fuels and that's um, there we need to increase energy efficiency and the, uh, make use of uh, renewables energies as good as possible. What you see here is um, um, some numbers how that describe how energy efficient the buildings in uh, in Europe are. Uh, right now, the, the building stock. I mean, this is uh, numbers from 2015, so not the, um, but not that much has changed. It's uh, it's becoming better. But you see um, here, uh, this is a metric that describes the energy efficiency per square meter. So you can compare different buildings. So uh, where the building stock is usually at, at, at 200 kilowatt hours per square meter of uh, floor area. Um, and that's for space heating, as you see, but also for the other things, electricity use and, and things like that. But you already see space heating here is a big uh, portion also. Uh, in Austria, about two thirds of the final energy used uh, in buildings is uh, goes for space heating. So making them uh, more energy efficient in terms of you know better envelope, uh, having um, um, better insulation, better windows, um, increasing the efficiency of the envelope um, has a big impact on the general uh, on the overall energy use of buildings, and of course. 
uh, increasing the efficiency of building services like uh, for heating, for ventilation, uh, for air conditioning, um, those things. Um, so combining this, there's a huge uh, savings um, potential for energy uh, by increasing the building energy efficiency. And to get um, an overview of what has happened in the last years or decades, there has been a lot uh, happening here. You see the evolution uh, in Germany of um, the energy efficiency of the, let's say, of the envelope. This is the, um, the heating demand for, um, so the heating demand, so for space heating, again, in kilowatt hours per square meter. And the top line there uh, that goes down like a step uh, is uh, what the regulation said, the minimum requirements. Um, so right now they're uh, here uh, at um, around 50 kilowatt hours per square meters. And the bottom line, you see um, what the research was showing, the pilot projects here. A famous one um, is the first passive house in 1991 that showed that you can uh, actually heat a building instead of with 150 or 200 kilowatt um, hours per square meter, uh, you can heat it actually with only uh, 10 to 15 uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, and, and the building practice is somewhere in between and, uh, and of course, um, Maybe some of you know, or maybe some of you don't know. There's this: um, the European Union has done its thing for this to uh, to bring um, to drive this down with this uh, European Building Performance Directive. Uh, that um, it's a directive, so it applies uh, the member states to um, set actions to drive this energy efficiency up or the energy demand down. Um, but um, as you might have uh, heard in the media or talking with others, I have experienced that with my neighbors when it's about uh, discussing and deciding what to do with your building. Uh, there's this thing out there, um, energy, does energy efficiency measures even work? Um, you know, some say, oh, that you put insulation on, that doesn't help. And there's um, a lot out there on uh, in the media that says, you know, um, it doesn't, uh, there's this performance gap. That's this uh, key word that's often said. And uh, to that, I have this slide just saying, I uh, just want to say, yes, this performance gap does exist in certain cases. And uh, uh, of course, there has been uh, issues um, or there has been uh, projects where the uh, predicted energy uh, use um, was not uh, met by the real, or the real superseded it. Uh, but um, it's also important to point out that there's many, uh, many um, demo uh, projects where it has been shown that um, this uh, energy efficiency that's uh, aimed at can be met. And that's uh, shown here uh, with uh, the, the last green ones here, the passive house uh, standard as an example, but any case where um, I think the key message here is that quality assurance is very important. Uh, the more energy efficient you want to build, the more important is the quality assurance, not also not only in the construction, but also in the planning to make sure that um, uh, the planning tools you use are accurate enough uh, to predict, the models you use are accurate enough to predict um, what you actually build. And then of course, quality assurance during the construction and quality assurance also during the operation. And that's a little bit where I'm heading today. Um, quality assurance during the operation to make sure that the building operates as, as uh, designed. Um, an important point here is to make is also the huge spread that um, even if we predict something with uh, certain tools, the user behavior and to some extent also the climate condition, the weather will have a big impact on the actual energy use. And that's, uh, so if you have uh, somebody telling you, yeah, my house doesn't um, meet what it promised uh, uh, to meet in terms of energy efficiency, then uh, you, can, uh, you must say that, yeah, you're one, one has to look at, uh, it's one case. Um, it depends very much on the user behavior. If you have your heating at uh, 23 degrees or at 18 degrees, it's a huge difference. Or even just uh, well, one degree of difference is already a big difference. And um, you see it, at the end, you have a normal distribution um, in the building stocks that use a lot of energy and uh, also in the uh, highly energy efficient buildings like shown here. So here, 
each bar is one dwelling of uh, similar constructed buildings in this group. Um, so on average, um, they meet um, what was predicted, but of course on an individual basis, there's a, a big difference. So this is not, uh, just to point out that this is not the performance gap. The performance gap would be if the, the average uh, would deviate. So, um, but yes, uh, there, there have been, um, I'll just uh, put in some project reports or publications that uh, we know that from our experience that uh, in many pilot projects, uh, we've seen that as you monitor the building behavior over the, um, over the first year or so, uh, you see uh, you might detect uh, deviations from the expected behavior. And uh, sometimes um, you can, or many times you can, um, if you s detect such a uh, deviation, um, you can um, find the root cause in something not working as intended. And uh, sometimes it's uh, some actual uh, component that's faulty. Sometimes it's uh, another uh, thing not working as, as intended. So it's an, an anomalous, an, an non anomalous state, so it's in a faulty state. And that's um, that's something we want to detect. And that's uh, where um, what I want to present the work here uh, today here. Um, this is just a schematic to make the point that uh, part of this is, of, is that the building services, um, the building itself, the planning has become more complex as you try to make it more energy efficiency, more energy efficient. Uh, you have to think about more things, more uh, um, aspects during the design process. And of course, the building services themselves, so the heating, the cooling, the ventilation uh, is becoming more complex. Uh, there's um, uh, the integration of renewable energies like solar thermal collectors or PV that you integrate in the in the building and um, for the building to work and um, bring out the best uh, basically it, those systems need to work uh, together so um, <clears throat> there's reports so or we know of buildings that uh, heat and cool at the same time that's something that uh, shouldn't be happening but it's happening uh, because because things are not working as ideal together as, as they should. Um, so this is just some pictures from the technical rooms to illustrate that um, complexity is increasing. So what are typical faults and uh, what are the faults we are trying to um, detect here? Um, this um, publication uh, categorized it into uh, three main categories or phases uh, of the building life cycle um, from design, construction to operation. And, and as I mentioned before, the main focus now is certainly the operation uh, phase where there's uh, faults. Um, many of the faults are, uh, it's, you may say you're, you're a technician, you want to blame uh, the occupants, but uh, uh, some faults are uh, human behavior or wrong human behavior that could be like um, setting the thermostat or the controller at the wrong set point or program or setting wrong parameters, uh, overriding the commands from the controller um, or just as simple as leaving the window or the door open. Um, and uh, of course there's controller faults as I mentioned but also the faults or defects of uh, components in the HVAC, that stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, um, faults in the components like a faulty pump or a faulty valve, uh, a valve that gets stuck and doesn't open or close anymore, um, a fan that uh, breaks down and doesn't uh, move the air anymore, um, or other faults in um, BIS, uh, stands for building automation, in the building automation, automation <coughs> system. But uh, there might also be faults uh, that were introduced during the construction. Um, so those would be nice also to be able to detect, but that's of course harder, especially if you think of my title where I said data-driven, using data-driven models, so a, a model that's built upon uh, data um, from the running of the building won't be able to detect a, a fault that was already there at the beginning. But 
Um, and that's what I want to point out today. Also using maybe a bit of physics in the model, you might be able to even detect some of those faults uh, also. <clears throat> But what is uh, the basic principle of fault detection? So how, how can, uh, can the fault be detected? Um, at the top level, uh, what we need, of course, is the observation. In the old days, this might have been just observation by the building user or the, uh, the building maintainer, the technician, observing and noticing something. and. Uh, um, from then, from that deducing, there must be a fault. Uh, nowadays, uh, what we are working on is using building data. I'll, I'll talk in the next slide about uh, what data uh, is is used or can be used um, using online data or continuous uh, or data from continuous monitoring of the building to detect faults. So this um, the simple and this is the state of the art, I would say, what um, is implemented already in components or in building automation systems um, is the rule-based um, fault detection. So um, that's something like just comparing the actual room temperature and the set point temperature and the, if the deviation is uh, too high or below a, a certain uh, above or below a certain threshold, depends which direction. Um, then you could say that there must be a fault. Um, and the next step uh, when you can try to diagnose is uh, if you say also with a uh, rule-based approach to say if this deviation is above or below a certain threshold and the controller doesn't send out, a con uh, the heating controller doesn't send out a signal, then the, there must be a fault in the, the controller. Uh, there must be a fault in the controller. So. Um, this is a rule based approach, so the if then rules basically most of the time. So this is a state of the art and where we're trying to move now is more a model based approach. And there, there's this extra level introduced, what's called in the literature feature generation. Uh, what does this mean? This uh, means we try to introduce extra features uh, that we um, compare or that we observe or monitor. Like a feature could be uh, the output of a model. Um, like, for example, if you have um, a model that predicts the temperature evolution in the building um, based on the boundary conditions, based on the uh, external temperature, based on the, um, the weather, the sunshine, uh, and other um, external conditions that you get f um, information also via um, as an input data, then you um, this model can predict uh, what the temperature in the room should be based on those boundary conditions. And if you see a deviation uh, between the real temperature and this predicted temperature, then um, you uh, can deduce that there must be a fault um, or at least uh, um, the behavior is anomalous. Uh, um, uh, is, uh, there's an ano anomaly um, uh, between the behavior as the model would predict and the real behavior. So uh, the chances are high that there must be a fault. And uh, you can drive um, as you want to do also a diagnosis of what uh, where the fault uh, could come from. Um, you can use uh, or try to use the models also to do that. Um, for example, here, um, as um, you have, you know, with this uh, data-driven approach, you would use um, the data to train this model and uh, for this training you would estimate certain parameters that uh, for the uh, for the model and as you do this continuously you um, uh, identify these parameters uh, again and again uh, you could see you might see a change in these parameters uh, this an example could be the a parameter uh, describing uh, the building behavior of the building envelope could be the so-called heat loss heat loss coefficient. It describes how, how much heat is lost over the envelope, how efficient is the envelope, the building envelope. And if this changes drastically, um, you uh, this might give you an indication um, that um, the envelope is damaged or just as simple as a, a window is, is uh, wide open. So um, the core essence of this is that uh, fault detection is basically anomaly t uh, detection, uh, detecting an, um, an anomal behavior. 
and um, and we do that by comparing uh, measurements uh, from the current state of the building with model predictions. So with that, we need uh, models and uh, and data, of course. And um, data, uh, as you probably know, uh, you're aware of, is um, uh, there's more and more abundance of data also in the buildings. There's this concept of the smart home. So there's uh, building automation systems providing a lot of um, data or in the residential sector, the home automation. Um, smart meter is being introduced uh, in most of the buildings now, so they provide a, a, a timely, highly resolved um, information on the energy use, uh, not, all, not only on the electricity side, but also for the gas, uh, for example, um, there's smart meters. Um, there's um, data, uh, data repositories out there, um, for example, if you need uh, information on the uh, solar radiation, that's an important factor for building models uh, or things like that. So there's an abundance of data that um, um, one can use to um, train and uh, build data-driven building models. Um, so to be a bit more specific, I'll, I want to show you examples of um, how such models uh, could look like. The first example is uh, for a component, like an air handling unit. In this case, uh, a handling unit is used to cool the air. So an air conditioning system or the air handling unit of an air conditioning system. On the left, you would have here the outdoor air uh, coming in. Uh, it goes over a damper filter. There you would have uh, the cooling coil. Um, so that actually cools the air and the fan and that's supplied into the rooms and then there's some return air that partly goes out and partly is recirculated. And um, we would describe the physical uh, energy balance, basically the uh, physical model describing the mass and or energy balance uh, simply with this uh, uh, equation here. Uh, that's basically the uh, heat uh, coming in uh, outdoor air, the heat from the recirculated air, plus the heat put in or taken out by this cooling coil must be, is the balance, must be what uh, goes out here by the supply air. So this is just rewritten. And then just to show you how then a data-driven model um, based on this uh, physical representation uh, could look like, um, you have this um, same here, except that for some param parameters that uh, we don't know, or that we don't measure uh, directly, like the mass flow of the air is not measured directly, but uh, there's pressure sensors. And from physics, we know that the mass flow is proportional uh, to the square root of the pressure difference. So you could introduce that as a, uh, as a parameter describing the mass flow, or we know that the heat, uh, put in or taken out by the cooling coil uh, is can be described by the by a power law uh, where the uh, SCC stands for the uh, valve um, valve angle if you want like that or the valve, the valve position uh, and then so you would have um, the other parameters that depend on the on the temperature difference and uh, so you would have a number of parameters and uh, so you can train the data. Uh, if you have uh, sufficient data and you estimate those parameters and with once you have estimated those parameters, you can predict um, future states, basically. You can predict into the, the future. Here's an example also how they um, use the dummy, what I call a dummy variable, a binary va variable to introduce also the, the schedule if um, the building is in use or not in use because that might depend on... Uh, uh, if then the recirculation is active or not. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I think I leave it with that. Uh, that was an example for the um, for building component. Um, I'll give a short introduction how a model for the building itself uh, looks like. So there, it's again the same approach. We do an energy balance. Um, what goes into a room or a building, 
we most we often call that a zone because sometimes a zone can be in uh, a two or three rooms put together or the whole house uh, looked as uh, one zone or you look uh, at one room at each um, room you look at a room by room basis uh, so we make an energy balance so there's transmission losses going out through the walls there's ventilation uh, and infiltration losses so that's uh, the air exchange through the cracks basically to, um, of the envelope and the solar gains uh, internal heat gains and then the heating or cooling and that's basically uh, it that's uh, and if you have that in balance then you would have a stationary case the temperature would stay the same and um, and that that is <clears throat> uh, this model is uh, often sufficient for um, energy calculations like energy like what you would have in the energy certificate is a calculation uh, on a, st a stationary based calculation on monthly based you do this monthly by monthly and then you get an estimate what and that's what the energy certificate would give you but if you want models that depict also the dynamics, uh, so the uh, um, evolution of the temperature or the, um, the timely evolution of the heat input that's needed, then you need an in-stationary in model. And then you say what, whatever the balance is of the heat that goes in and out must be uh, uh, the part that uh, increases or decreases the temperature. So that's uh, what you see here, the uh, time derivative of the temperature multiplied by c that's uh, the heat capacity of of the room of the building basically so that's a, a simplified model for the room um, and um, in building modeling we have this uh, taking this approach to make the an, an analogy to uh, electrical networks because that works and there's a direct um, the, an analogy between the two uh, the mathematical equations basically look the same you can describe the heat flow um, is the same as the electrical uh, the electric so the heat uh, flow the heat current uh, is the same as the electrical current and the uh, the potential or the voltage is the same as the temperature difference is the driving force basically for the heat flow so um, we like to use those um, illustrations or pictures uh, to represent uh, our models and uh, represent our uh, differential equation describing um, the behavior of our building. So here you'd have the um, heat flow from the heater uh, coming into the room or into the building, uh, the heat coming in from through your window, uh, solar gains uh, and um, and the uh, heat coming in or going out through the envelope um, and that would be uh, the, the energy balance here it must be uh, the change in temperature as said before um, if you want to go in more detail uh, or make a very detailed physical model you you need to go deeper let's say or be more detailed uh, this is just an example uh, for a wall where the heat flow through the wall you would have to uh, make it um, it's usually discretized in different layers and then you can try to uh, model also the temperature um, distribution within the, the that component or you can you derive also more exactly the heat flow through it uh, it basically describes the heat equation which um, is the equation that describes the heat conduction in, in solid material. Um, so if you combine those, um, you would have a detailed physical model. Uh, so you would combine that for each wall. Uh, you'd have combined other models uh, for, the, for the window, describing how a window behaves. Uh, you'd have models for the different components and so on. And you combine this into one big model and that's what we call a white box model and that's actually what uh, building simulation software does or uh, or is is a, is a model like that in um, and um, there's commercial softwares out there also academic softwares out there so that's what we would call a white box model you try to um, uh, mimic the physical reality as close as possible um, with those kind of models and uh, with that you can predict uh, all states I would say uh, state with states I mean the temperature 
different temperatures in the room, the different heat in uh, uh, heat loads and so on in any boundary condition. So if you feed um, the right parameters like the material, the density of the material, the uh, conductivity of the material, the geometry, how the construction is made up um, and all this into the model, uh, you give certain boundary conditions like the weather or the internal heat gains uh, in the room. Uh, with that, you can predict any state and uh, if the physics uh, put you know, are right, then um, it doesn't matter what the boundary conditions is, or you can predict um, uh, the behavior of the building correctly. And that's what's used in the design stage of uh, optimizing a building, basically. Um, but uh, as you may think, it's a lot of, it's complex model, you have to enter a lot of parameters. And in fact, as uh, um, shown that due to that co complexity, it's often you, the model itself would work good, is accurate, but uh, due to the complexity, somewhere the user enters something wrong, and and at the end, the overall um, accuracy is sometimes not as high as one would uh, think. On the other hand, we may use um, black box model that are purely data driven. Um, so you would use uh, training data uh, to derive um, parameters that have no physical meaning uh, per se, but um, that can predict the behavior, for example, of the temperature in your room um, quite accurately, at least for a certain uh, prediction period of hours or days or maybe even weeks, but uh, not much beyond usually because uh, or it depends very much on what the training data is. Um, if you, you, as you can imagine, if you train a black box model with uh, winter data, uh, you won't be able to predict the behavior of the building in the summer uh, because it's just um, outside of the boundary conditions that you had uh, during the training. And uh, something in between is this gray box model approach where you put in some physics, uh, physical knowledge, um, and also training data. So you estimate some parameters. The parameters have usually some sort of physical interpretation, uh, like the heat capacity. You can interpret it as the heat capacity of the interior of the walls and so on, but you won't find actually the 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 you, the, the right physical um, equivalent. Uh, so what heat capacity you put in of the first centimeters of the wall or the whole entire wall or things like that. So those have a physical interpretation, but you need data to uh, estimate them because they don't have a direct physical interpret um, uh, equivalent. But you can use this model to predict um, within the boundary condition that you train the data for, for sure. And you might even go beyond because the physics allow you to go a bit beyond uh, that what you trained uh, the model for. Um, so for the application wise, then you already know, as, as I said already, the, the, the white box model, the building simulation tools are used uh, during the design stage when there is no measurement data. Uh, to uh, optimize the building design, but they can also be used then later on to, um, um, for example, if you do, you can calibrate your model and see if certain parameters are as you expect. And with that, you could uh, try to do, uh, to identify or, or calibrate certain parameters and see if they are as they should be, if the, con if the, if the building is constructed as it is. And um, that's what we call here, um, physical parameter identification. So you can do that also with gray box models and you can use that as an application for the quality control um, uh, of the S-built condition. And um, what I'm talking today is about the, uh, is more on this side, um, the building um, behavior identification where you just, um, with those models you want to identify the building or describe the building behavior and uh, applications for that are like uh, building model predictive control. So that's uh, controllers that uh, use a model to predict how the next hours or days will be and depending on that they will turn on the heating or uh, turn it off or, or use PV for heating uh, and load your buffer or something like that. That's model predictive control and the other application is uh, fault detection. So 
with that um, you have a, uh, a, a prediction and you compare it to the real state and if there's a, a deviation you can use it. Um, so I want to shortly um, show you um, or tell you about those uh, projects that have been going on and where we were involved. This is an international collaborative project um, annex uh, from the International, international Energy Agency and there uh, the focus was actually um, developing and testing such models for those two um, applications like building behavior identification and physical parameter identification so for um, uh, quality control and and the other one the building behavior like for the fault detection or the model predictive control and there's a, a nice exercise um, that was th that we did in this project that was done in this project and um, those are uh, single family uh, houses built at the Fraunhofer site so they are for uh, experimental purposes only and those houses were um, heated or used uh, or experimented with in a certain period a couple of months uh, different phases where the heating was more on or then so certain user behavior was mimicked um, and at some point a fault uh, were um, intentionally put into the uh, operation basically and then uh, the measured data was given to the participants in these projects uh, without telling them what fault and what time the fault was put in and uh, and the different uh, teams could uh, then try uh, to find the faults basically and they put in those three faults like a floor heating uh, uh, mimicking a, a stuck valve in the floor heating uh, on then also a failure in the ventilation uh, partial and full and and this um, was given uh, this data was given to the uh, modelers uh, telling them this is the training period where no fault is and this is the period where some faults might have been and here as an example uh, to see how that works you have this gray box uh, uh, or the result from a gray box model the here up here is compare the measured temperature in the room and the predicted the model, uh, the predicted temperature evolution, uh, and you clearly see here, here starts a deviation. You see that um, if nicer, if you plot the residual, so the difference between the model and the measured, and you uh, clearly see that here, or you can uh, then analyze this data of these residuals uh, to detect that there must have been a fault here. And um, that was done, and they, uh, they, this team also did uh, went the next step and tried to uh, uh, diagnose uh, or say where the cause could be, and that's um, they did it like I mentioned before. They um, did on a daily basis. They estimated the parameters or one of the parameters in them gray box models on a daily basis, and uh, those are the black dots here. And you see the um, it gives this heat transfer coefficient. It's a certain metric for the envelope. And um, it stays up there until a certain point where you um, see that um, it goes down um, by a certain amount. And from there, you can uh, deduce that something must have happened to the, um, either to the building envelope or the heat uh, sources have changed. So there, um, they deduce that the, uh, the envelope, which includes the ventilation strategy, there's something to the ventilation strategy it must have changed, so they um, derived that correctly. And here they said this change in uh, heat transfer coefficient is too big. Uh, it can't, couldn't be the, uh, the envelope itself. There must be an undetected heat source. So with that, they were not fully on, but uh, close, um, uh, close to the cause. They were um, detecting the right um, direction, let's say. But uh, certainly, there's more research uh, needed to to um, help or to uh, develop methods for diagnosing and finding the causes. And this is an overview. There was in total five teams participated. Um, two of them used a gray gray box uh, approach. Uh, three of them uh, a black box approach. Random forest RX stands for um, autoregressive uh, model with exact hexagonous uh, inputs and uh, uh, ARIMA models uh, also auto regressive um, there are black box models and the, as you can see 
Oh, I, I showed this here with the stars, uh, how many detected uh, uh, fault A, only one of the teams detected fault A. This is uh, had a certain, oh, from that we learned, uh, we learned something. The reason why they only detected that is they, um, the others uh, use the heat input as an, uh, or the heat input as an input into the model. And that way, um, yeah, this fault, which shows in the uh, heat input was not detected is part of the, the, in, the fault is part as an input basically, but the other faults were detected. The fault B was detected uh, by most of the participants of the models uh, four out of five and the uh, fault C by three. So um, shows that uh, things are detected. It can be detected, but certainly more work is needed to, um, um, to make this more uh, robust in detecting uh, Things. So that's um, what um, I'm working on, um, and this is a project that's ongoing. Uh, we're part of this, uh, also other partners, Forschung um, Burgenland and TU Wien and the uh, Fachhochschule uh, Salzburg. And um, in this project, we try to um, as um, develop uh, fault detection methods in particular or with a focus on uh, uh, ventilation, building ventilation systems. And uh, time is quite advanced, so I, I go fast over this. Uh, this is something uh, the colleagues from Forschung Burgenland are looking at is, is how to derive information about the building itself uh, from the so-called BIM model. Build, BIM stands for Building Information Modeling. So this is a big model uh, that's used by architects and planners that should describe the building, the geometry, what's used, um, and so on in very detail. And it also describes or it also should include information about the um, uh, network, like in this case, the ventilation, the ducting network. And um, they uh, use um, some algorithms to uh, extract um, the network uh, out of this BIM model to create um, uh, a representation where you can derive then how the network is uh, connected to each other so you can know how the flows go, uh, the airflow goes and uh, which um, rooms or which part of the ducting network is affected um, if something changes upstream basically. I'll go over that. Uh, quickly and, and show you some parts that uh, we've done here or I've done is um, this is a rather simple approach. Uh, we did first tests basically. Um, so there, within this project we have this, let's call it living lab, a building uh, that's actually used uh, that where a lot of data is monitored that we can use. And there I try to estimate uh, the building, uh, the occupant numbers um, and the ventilation status uh, based on the indoor air quality and the measured CO2 concentration in the room. Uh, I used a simple analytic, analytic model and uh, did a piecewise uh, fitting algorithm uh, to estimate um, uh, the person count in the room and, and the ventilation status if the ventilation is on or off. Um, um, first results seem plausible, um, uh, but a, a validation and uh, exact a good validation uh, of the method is still pending. Um, I didn't have the data so far about, especially about the person uh, being um, present to do the full validation. Um, The next step, and that's where I'm working on, I was hoping to be able to present you some results already. But um, unfortunately, um, I was um, um, put set back in time, let's say it that way. Uh, so we're still working on that. Um, is to use gray box models, um, combining a gray box model for the thermal representation, as you see it here. So as I showed you before, this is the uh, representation with those electrical uh, pictures, let's call it like that. and the, uh, differential equations, and uh, we use the so-called state state space representation. It's a linear time invariant system, basically, uh, that describe um, 
the building behavior that, uh, that describe or that uh, are represented by those differential equations. And um, you have those matrices uh, that include the parameters that we need to identify. And once those are identified, the, the model can be used to predict um, the behavior. Here you see some first results um, from uh, model and uh, measured or the comparison vision model and measurement. You see this, um, the general overall trend is uh, reproduced, but the, the small peaks here are not. So I need to go back and uh, maybe improve uh, this model uh, to be able to depict also this uh, this smaller uh, this um, peaks here. And um, how I want to do that is by combining actually uh, the thermal model and then air quality model. So in the thermal model, as I described before, is uh, is uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me is the uh, balance of uh, energy flows um, and uh, I you can extend that and make a balance over the pollutants coming into the room and pollutants going out into the room. You can depict it also with an um, differential equation like that, and then um, there's a way to couple those, those are interconnected by each other because the flow, airflow that brings in the pollutants uh, brings in or takes out also energy. So those two uh, models are connected. You can combine those and that um, uh, has some advantages because there's a lot of uh, usually, or it's very common to have CO2 data about the indoor air quality in rooms and that can be helpful to supplement the thermal model uh, to get um, uh, more information about the status on the ventilation. Um, so the air flows going in and out of the room or of the building. Uh, there's some challenges um, that this um, ventilation is not necessarily time invariant. So uh, this time invariant methods might um, um, uh, or might limit this uh, part. So we'll have to make some assumptions or move on to methods that can deal with uh, non-time invariant uh, problems. Good. Um, with that, I want to summarize. Um, as I brought into the, uh, at the beginning, there's an urgent need to increase energy efficiency in buildings, um, in new, and especially uh, during the refurbishment, so uh, um, making the energy efficiency of uh, building stock better. And for that, we need uh, quality assurance uh, methods uh, are important uh, to make sure that uh, this works and this uh, that this performance gap, as observed in some cases, um, are or can be uh, avoided. And applying fault detection uh, and um, diagnosis can help uh, ensuring the performance, especially during uh, operation. But as I said, also with the hope of uh, uh, being able to use those methods uh, to detect faults that arise from construction already. Um, the fault detection is based on detecting anomalies. Uh, and um, um, this is the basis um, for detecting faults or uh, also what I didn't mention so much uh, for using it for continuous improvement. Uh, that's what's called um, continuous uh, commissioning. And um, so there's an ongoing efforts by me, but but the other colleagues in those international projects um, to, um, to develop those methods on these models further um, and combine those methods, uh, those models uh, describing the building, describing the um, building systems, uh, like components, combining them um, to get more information of uh, on the building behavior. And um, there's this span or this spectrum of uh, approaches from white box to black box models, uh, full spectrum in between. Uh, all, pro all approaches um, have are feasible and have disadvantages or advantages. So it's a matter of trying, uh, trying uh, exploring which ones work good for which application and under which circumstances. And that's part of the work uh, I'm involved in. So um, as said, this is um, 
the, the project. So I showed you some of the projects um, working right now and trying to combine the uh, thermal model and the air quality model uh, in a gray box approach. Um, and the next step will also be to uh, try trying out black box model and comparing the performance of those uh, with the gray box approach um, with the goal of detecting a faults uh, in the building ventilation system. So with that said, I'm finished. Sorry, I think uh, the time is a bit longer than maybe planned. Um, uh, if you're further interested in this topic, there's an, uh, next week there's an, a webinar where um, myself and colleagues from, the, uh, from those projects uh, will present um, something related to this also. Thank you very much. I'm happy to hear any questions. Yes, thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, I guess we can stop the recording.